Welcome to In Focus with Ajaz Haider. Our top story tonight is about Trump administration's latest effort to ratchet up the maximum pressure campaign against Iran. Last Saturday, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said that U.S. had reimposed the U.N. sanctions against Iran. Experts say the move has left the U.S. isolated and even close allies like the United Kingdom are not going to follow suit. It's important to note that what the U.S. is trying to do is not about its own unilateral sanctions regime against Iran. Washington is calling for a snapback of U.N. sanctions against Iran with reference to Iran's obligations under the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, commonly known as the Iran Nuclear Deal. Other state parties to the JCPOA point out that U.S. has no locus standi in the matter because it unilaterally walked out of the deal in May 2018. The JCPOA was endorsed by the UN Security Council through Resolution 2231. There's some controversy about whether that makes the deal legally binding on the US. To discuss this further, we are joined by Ambassador Matthew Breiser, a former US diplomat, Reza Khanzadeh, research fellow at Sharif University Think Tank, and a PhD candidate at Oxford. Thank you to both panelists. Uh, let me, before I get to uh, Mr. Khanzadeh, remind the viewers that Iranian ambassador to the UN has hit back uh, saying that the stated objective of the US is to completely ruin the JCPOA. That those are uh, the words of the statement. And the strategy is to create legal complication through presenting unilateral arbitrary interpretations and pseudo legal arguments. Uh, this is uh, from the statement uh, by the UN, uh, the Iranian ambassador to the UN. Uh, let me pull in Mr. Khanzadeh here. Mr. Khanzadeh, it seems that Iran is on pretty firm ground when it comes to this particular move by the United States. You pointed earlier in your segment, you have essentially uh, the entire, um, you know, the European Union in Russia and China uh, supporting Iran. Um, I am no legal scholar, but from what I have, you know, followed and also read, um, there really is no legal ground for the U.S. to stand on and try to snap back these sanctions. Um, but this is all uh, something, in my opinion, um, symbolic, and there's a deeper push, which I fear uh, what are what are many calling um, the October surprise, where. You see a Trump, Trump administration, uh, you know, pursuing this maximum pressure campaign against Iran for the past, you know, almost four years, um, and now recently you have a U.S. aircraft carrier going into the Strait of Hormuz, which has been suggested is a a you know, I guess a tactic, if you will, to try to seize any ships that they suspect is, um, you know, carrying, um, you know. Um, what was it, oil from Iran. Um, but then you also have a, a few, you know, there are a few whispers that even the Trump administration might uh, no longer fund the UN if they don't back the US on these snapbacks. Um, so it, it kind of seems that the US is trying to push Iran in this corner where they're almost, you know, egging them on to act in some kind of aggressive way so that way the U.S. can potentially, um, as they would hope, uh, go into some kind of conflict with Iran, which then hopefully might help Trump um, in his bid to get, you know, to get, uh, you know, four more years, you know, so. So, yeah, you, you're basically suggesting that a lot of this has to do with uh, uh, domestic politicking and, of course, the U.S. presidential race. But let me uh, pull in Ambassador Breiser here. Ambassador Breiser, well, we have discussed the Trump administration several times on this program. Um, and I believe, uh, you know, it's very difficult to uh, try and figure out what kind of, uh, you know, IR or whatever interstate relations framework uh, President Donald Trump uses, but it seems to me that he, the Trump administration has overplayed this hand uh, in this particular case. Uh, is that your sense also? 
Uh, it remains to be seen. I mean, certainly I agree with Mr. Amzadeh that it appears there's no legal ground, no legal basis for this decision uh, by the Trump administration. And even, you know, three of the U.S.'s closest allies, uh, Germany, France and the United Kingdom, issued a joint statement saying exactly that, saying that if you're not a member of the JCPOA, then you don't have any authority uh, under that agreement to insist on snapback sanctions. But what the Trump administration is saying is something different, I think. They're saying regardless of whether we're legally party to this agreement, uh, this is what we want you to do. Uh, we want you all, uh, all the, the, the current members of the JCPOA, uh, we want you to implement these snapback sanctions. And if you don't, uh, there will be consequences. And we will impose, it sounds like, secondary sanctions against your entities and your financial institutions and anybody that does not comply with these sanctions. So there, the Trump administration is blurring international law and U.S. law in a case of might makes right. And what worries me as a former American official and as an American citizen is that it's not that the Trump administration is backed into a corner. Um, those secondary sanctions are potent. My worry is you can, you can only use those so many times until everybody else in the world says, we've had enough of you. We're not going to be dependent on the dollar anymore uh, because we don't want our financial systems to be held hostage to these sorts of unilateral steps by the United States. Last point is politically, for certain, the United States is backed into a corner here with its in terms of the other members of the JCPOA. But I think what the Trump administration is also saying is we don't care. <laughs> our primary foreign policy goal right now is to squeeze Iran as much as possible. Uh, and so I think that's that's where the focus of the Trump administration is right now. And, and trying to squeeze Iran in this way fits right in. Absolutely. But, you know, I, I fear that there is a broader, of course, I mean, if this Iranian case is what we're discussing here, but there's a, there's a broader problem with this approach. Uh, and, you know, the United States post Second World War and thereafter, you know, the entire neoliberal paradigm, uh, the attempt uh, to create a multilateral rules-based order, uh, because that provided not just the, the pragmatic part of diplomacy, but also the moral standing of that diplomacy uh, in terms of uh, the global leadership. Now, with this kind of approach, and I completely agree with you that at some point, somebody will just stand up and say, you know, enough is enough. Uh, take a hike. And so this rules-based order uh, protected the U.S. interests as much as it protected other interests. Oh, I could not agree more with you, dear Mr. Hyder. And then, you know, I grew up, so to speak, both academically and professionally uh, as a staunch proponent of that rules-based system that, as you say, the U.S. created after World War II because operating according to those rules was always in the U.S. national interest. And by the way, I believe remains so to this day. The problem is uh, today that President Trump does not agree. And, you know, the recognition of what you just said, the rules-based system, um, that's a uh, that's an intellectual argument that happens to be true, uh, but not one that appeals to President Trump's base. You know, President Trump's core support, 35 percent that will never vote against him, is overwhelmingly white, uh, non-college educated males who are afraid of the globalized system based on uh, this on the rules because they see they're they're not benefiting from this system in which we have these integrated supply chains that drive down from their perspective, the cost of labor in the U.S. or, uh, or, or move jobs overseas, you know, they, they, don't, they don't see the issues in their totality. And this is who President Trump also is. Um, he, his foreign policy, as you and I have discussed many times, as you said on, on your excellent show, is not multilateral, collaborative, common interest among allies. It's instead transactional. He pursues to pursue uh, one countries uh, sort of in a competitive game, uh, so U.S. interests against one country in isolation rather than rather than uh, against a group of countries. Therefore, he favors Brexit because it's easier for the United States to secure trade benefits from the United Kingdom on its own. And it'll also be easier, he thinks, for the U.S. to deal with the, the European Union because without the United Kingdom, the EU will be, will be weaker. I think that's folly. I, I very much agree that the rules-based system is in the U.S. national interest. It was and it remains such. 
Right. So uh, finally, uh, let me just uh, jump ahead of the curve. Uh, speculative, obviously. We don't know how it's going to pan out the U.S. presidential elections. But in the event that uh, former Vice President Joe Biden uh, gets to the White House, do you think that uh, a lot of what the president, uh, you know, the Trump administration did uh, would be uh, revisited uh, and, and the U.S. foreign and security policies rationalized? I think, uh, well, Vice President Biden has made clear that one of his initiatives, were he to be elected president, would be to bring the United States back into the JCPOA, which, you know, there are some complications to actually doing that, but I'm sure those complications could be worked through. Uh, I have no doubt, having worked with, with then-Senator Biden directly, uh, that he highly values the international rules-based system and NATO as well. Um, so I think we would see, as you put it, a, a re-rationalization of U.S. foreign policy. That being said, however, and as Hegel teaches us, right, uh, history is an ongoing action-reaction cycle. And so the Trump phenomenon is a reaction to President Obama, who was a reaction to President George W. Bush in a lot of ways. And so that, that, that core base of Trump supporters that don't appreciate the international rules-based system and like the idea of a stronger United States taking on countries transactionally and individually rather than through multilateral diplomacy, I think that's going to be out there in American uh, thinking uh, and for, for a long time and will be present when, when if Biden is elected, then when his successor uh, will, will come into power. So um, I just hope that we will find a way as a country, the United States, uh, to appreciate again how the rules-based system is in our favor. And, and part of that is going to require uh, reforming of some of the rules-based institutions. So last comment on my part, you know, the World Trade Organization is something that the Trump administration has highly criticized. And he, you know, the Trump administration has not allowed its uh, appeals court, which is the most important implementation body of the World Trade Organization uh, to have a quorum. He's blocked confirmation of the, of the necessary judges. Uh, at first, all the world, including myself, decried that, said, what are you doing? You're damaging the WTO. But now more and more people are saying, well, you know what? The WTO does need to be reformed, or, or NATO really does need the other allies to increase their defense spending. So if, if what Trump has done does lead to some reform of these institutions, then I think we could see an enduring appreciation uh, under the next president and the one after that president uh, for the rules-based system and a rationalized approach to foreign policy with the United States showing leadership again. I agree with you. I mean, most of these world bodies require reform, but I don't think that the Trump administration has been uh, putting the pressure on them in order to reform them. But thank you so much. It's always a pleasure speaking with you, Ambassador Braza. Uh, enjoy your vacation in, in Bodrum. Let me go back to uh, Raza Khanzadeh here. Uh, Mr. Khanzadeh, uh, you heard Ambassador Braza, even within the United States, uh, discerning people uh, are not particularly uh, in favor of the U.S. policy uh, with reference to the JCPOA. But uh, on the ground, one has to put up with what's there. And uh, what Secretary Pompeo said in terms of also uh, putting allies uh, on uh, notice, it seems to me that uh, things might get tougher for Iran. Uh, at least in the in the near future. Yes, um, I, I I I do see that uh, transpiring in in the coming months and years, uh, particularly um, if if we see a scenario where Trump does get reelected, and then I believe uh, five or six months later you have the Iranian elections for their next president, um, which from from what I've been gathering inside Iran is that, because um, right now Iran's population is primarily citizens under the age of 35, which I think account for roughly around 70%. And the vast majority of them have been discussing boycotting uh, the, you know, that election, which then would point to um, a type of president who is more of a hardliner, more of a far right, if you will. Uh, and that will complicate matters even worse when it comes to the relations between Iran and the U.S. Um, but then on the other scenario, if Biden gets reelected, I, 
I still am somewhat skeptical, you know, somewhat, you know, cautious about, uh, you know, his presidency, his White House being able to re-enter the JCPOA. Um, I don't see it being that easy for them. They would have to perhaps give, you know, give in some concessions. Um, but that type of isolation for Iran uh, in the eyes of America is um, paramount. Uh, I think whether it's Trump or Biden, because they would still see that as kind of forcing them or forcing their hand to come to the table. Um, but that, I think, is more of a waiting game because we have to see who the next president of Iran is going to be. And then also you have their strong relations with Russia and also with China, um, who seem uh, quite you know, quite determined to, um, you know, undermine the U.S. in its foreign foreign policy dealings when it comes to Iran. Um, but even that uh, might seem to hit a wall, uh, you know, going back to what the ambassador said, um, you know, with with what the U.S. was able to do between, you know, you know Bahrain and, um, you know, in Israel. And also I've heard Kuwait might be next. So, um, it is. It is going to be uh, a difficult road, uh, but then again, it's been it's been a difficult road now for 41 years. Um, it, it seems that the stars rarely do align to where you see the U.S. You know, and Iran um, being able to uh, come to some type of terms where both parties would agree to, you know, sign their name next to the X, if you will, when it comes, you know, for example, the JCPOA. Uh, so. Um, yeah, it's it's going to be difficult, but you know we've seen Iran, you know, battle through these sanctions and secondary sanctions. Um, you know, they are a very resilient country. Uh, so as far as as far as the Iran side, um, I think I think they will be able to weather the storm. Um, but also one last note, if I if I may, um, you know, going back to the youth, you know, boycotting uh, these these you know. Um, next elections, um, they're also playing a waiting game, you know, as well domestically, uh, because they see that their system is a little, um, not a little, but, you know, they see their system as very corrupt. Um, and they actually want to wait and see what happens when their supreme leader, you know, leaves office. For them, it's not really a battle for the presidency, whether it's a moderate or, a, you know, um, I guess, a, you know, conservative reformist, if you will, but it's more of that supreme leadership role for them that's that's really their waiting game as well that's a very interesting observation um, in fact when you talked about china and russia we just got the right person uh, joining us guy burton was an adjunct professor of international relations at Vesalius college in brussels also authored a book on china uh, guy uh, this with this sort of you know maximum pressure campaign now of course, uh, as, uh, as you know, uh, even the close allies, France, Germany, and the United Kingdom have basically said, uh, we are not going to be a part of this. But of course, the Trump administration is pushing it. How much do you think, in terms of, we already know that Iran has very close relations with Russia and China, but how much more do you think uh, these relations would become important for Iran, given the, you know, the renewed sort of uh, U.S. maximum pressure campaign against it. Well, thank you very much for having me on the on the show again today, and and thank you for also sort of mentioning the book about uh, that I've been look, working on about China in the Middle East. Um, I guess if you want to sort of talk initially about sort of Russia and China, and I think it sort of leads follow follows on from what your previous co uh, correspondent was saying. I mean, yes. Iran has you know, better relations with those two countries, but we should also keep in mind that it is not a, you know, a comprehensively smooth relationship. Um, it's a situation in which the Iranians are pretty much dependent on China and Russia for support. And, and for all three of them, uh, that you know, the priority is going to be, you know, where is the United States in all of this? Uh, so if you look at the sort of the Chinese and, and the Iranians, for example, they had, 
you know, there was uh, quite a lot of, um, you know, hullabaloo a couple of months ago with, you know, the signing of, a, of an agreement that there was potentially going to be more Chinese investment and trade. Um, the details of that are still uncertain, but I know that from speaking to colleagues who work on this, this subject, um, a lot of the sort of the, the, the ideas are somewhat inflated. Uh, and the idea that the Iranians are going to get a very good deal out of this is, is more debatable, that it's actually going to push the Iranians into a much more dependent relationship with the Chinese. Uh, as for the Europeans, certainly, yes, we've seen that the Europeans themselves have been you know, skeptical and critical of the United States in terms of you know, trying to reimpose sanctions. But we should also let, not forget that the Europeans have their own uh, problems with, with Iran. Um, you know, back in January, they actually initiated, uh, you know, sort of the joint, dis sorry, the dispute resolution mechanism, you know, within the JCPOA, because they were unhappy with the fact that Iran was, um, you know, increasing its stockpiling and processing of uranium and also starting to look at the development of centrifuges which are not allowed under the agreement. Um, so that process is still ongoing. So it's very much the case that the Europeans are working through the system rather than sort of saying, let's just have snap back right now. Now, at the moment, we're still waiting for, you know, the IE, you know, the International Atomic Agency, which was having its own problems with Iran, you know, to report back on, um, you know, its investigations in, in Iran. Certainly those have started again this month. Um, we, but we may, we don't know yet when the, when the statements will be made and then what, what that means for the process, the dispute resolution process itself. I agree with you, Guy, but here's the thing. I mean, the Europeans know this uh, because, you know, when uh, the U.S. walked out of JCPOA in May 2018, uh, the Iranians said, well, you know, okay, uh, look, we, we are going to comply with this, uh, but you need to uh, act as a bulwark against any U.S. sanctions. And uh, there was a lot of talk and, you know, the Europeans tried to uh, create some kind of uh, special utility vehicle to somehow offset the sanctions or reduce the impact, but couldn't really work it out. And so Iran kept saying, well, if you don't do this, then we're going to start doing certain other things, which obviously uh, in violation, gradually in violation of the JCPOA. So I think the, the, the sense uh, to me as far as the, the Europeans are concerned is that they're they do not really want uh, JCPOA to be completely ruined. And I think they believe that with this uh, move by the Trump administration, that that's exactly uh, what the US objective is. Absolutely. I feel it's, it's very much the case that the Europeans don't want the agreement to collapse. And this is why they've, they're, they're working through the, pro the, the dispute resolution process at the moment. And, and I think all sides are wanting to see, to wait this out until after November. Um, you know, the, what we have here is a deadline, which is not, you know, sort of the date in which uh, sanctions would snap back as the Americans want, but the deadline is actually the election, which right. is, you know, if Biden comes in, then potentially there's a possibility that Biden might come back to the JCPOA. Um, but I don't know whether there's any kind of planning going on regarding what happens if Trump gets re-elected, because if he does, he's going to be, you know, have a stronger mandate to, to maintain and to push the, you know, push, uh, you know, for maximum pressure. That could actually lead to, you know, very adverse consequences. And we might see the Iranians seek to break out and to speed up the process of, of creating enough material to be able to produce a bomb. Because perhaps as we see you know, in the course of the Trump administration, Trump has himself has been willing to talk to you know, Kim Jong-un of North Korea, you know, almost as an equal. So I'm sure that has not gone unnoticed by the Iranian leadership. Absolutely. Uh, well, if Trump is re-elected, then I think, you know, I mean, there are lots of important rebels, but it seems to me that uh, there's going to be uh, uh, the, you know, ex the realignments, uh, shall I say, will become re -ex you know, expedited. But thank you so much. That was Guy Burton speaking with us. Thank you also to Raza Khanzadeh for his insights.